episode 27. Welcome to the Fatherhood Fitness Finance Podcast, your training resource for being a happy, healthy, and wealthy dad. Hey guys, hope you're crushing it today. Today we have Cedric Thomas on the show, goes by Ced. He's a defensive back in the NFL. He also started a YouTube channel a few years ago called As Said By Me, and he has 117 subscribers as well as 7.2 million views, which is crazy. We'll talk to him about how this channel got started, what he did to get from 1,000 subscribers to 50,000 subscribers, and more. He's a relative newlywed at a few years married, which is great because most of our guests are married for 10 or 20 years. So we can kind of dive into the beginning of the relationship or the marriage and talk about what they had to do to get on the same team or run the household together. We'll also touch on sports and what advice he has to support our kids in sports, but not maybe over support or make decisions for them and really, you know, just do our best to stay out of the way and let them play whatever sport they want to play. Well, all right, let's talk to Sid. Hey, Sid. So excited to have you on, man. I'm excited to talk to you. Hey, thanks for having me on, man. I'm super excited to chat with you and uh, kind of catch up and see what's all going on. Yeah, that's perfect. I've really enjoyed your videos, man. And i got to be honest, I thought they were professionally done when <laughs> I first saw them. Like, and by that, I mean not you, but someone else was doing them. <laughs> like, I really did. Like, I don't know why. Like, I just assumed, like, oh, I guess he paid someone to do all these because they look great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I've, um, so I started a little bit over a year ago. Uh, I've never really um, knew much about videography or anything like that. I kind of just wanted to start something, and I kind of just, you know, with trial and error and trying different things, I found my own style, and I've been making my videos for the past uh, year, and it's uh, I've learned a lot, and I think I found my own uh, rhythm and style that kind of fits my personality, and um, I've got a lot of good feedback from, you know, my subscribers and people mm -hmm. um, who watch the videos, and they love them. So it just makes me feel good that all the work is actually paying off. I see a ton of engagement on your videos. It seems like your subscriber base is pretty uh, pretty intense, or I guess it's just big fans. Is that kind of the impression you get? Yeah, that's definitely what I get. You know, it's funny because I, um, I never planned for my YouTube channel to be this big, to be honest with you. I honestly started um, after I got released from the Patriots. It was the kind of the first time I was like, man, like football can be taken away from me at any time. i got to figure out else figure out what else I would want to do if it's in, if it ends because, you know, football is what I've always done. It's what I've worked my whole life for, and without it, I would felt like I would be lost. And now I've found this hobby that's turning, that's turning into, you know, a passion for me that I really enjoy making videos and helping people through my videos while being raw and being honest and showing people, you know, don't be afraid of who you are in your own skin because that ultimately got you where you are today. And uh, just to be comfortable with that and embrace it. On day one, I guess, like what inspired you to go on YouTube.com and create a login and account and everything? Like what started – like I know you mentioned the Patriots, but why that versus any other business in the world? Did you already like film? No, so I'm, I'm originally from Los Angeles, California. I grew up in South Central L.A., lived in Inglewood, lived in Compton. And um, playing football was always the way to get out, you know. And my, my parents put me in football really early, so it kind of became a part of my life. But I always knew football wasn't um, all I ever wanted to do. I've always loved video. I've always loved creating stuff. But I didn't, written, I didn't really have time to do that growing up because it was either playing football, trying to stay out of trouble, and going to school. Um, I didn't really have time to be creative because being creative wasn't really preached where I was from. So I've always known that I loved video. And I watched YouTube uh, growing up as a kid. You know, I think YouTube really got popular when I was in middle school on the brink of high school. And uh, I will always watch YouTube videos. I'll watch uh, – vloggers is, is really a new thing now, but I'll watch, like, people just make videos, upload stuff, and I always really enjoyed it. I've always loved, you know, going to movies and seeing, you know, really cool creative stuff um, uh, growing up. And so I was like, I'm just going to start a YouTube channel and kind of document my life from uh, my perspective because, you know, being an athlete, I always got my life documented from other people, oh, yeah. whether that's being on the news, newspapers, articles. And I was like, man, I want to tell my story from my perspective and not have somebody else write it out for me and tell them, you know, how I feel about the things that I've been through, been through yeah. throughout my life. So did anything – right now you're at 117,000 subscribers. What do you think – like what got mm -hmm. you from like 1,000 subscribers to 50,000? Like was there any trick in that realm? Uh, I wouldn't say it was it wasn't yeah. no trick. Um, a lot of people always ask me, you know, how do you get a hundred thousand subscribers? How do you get, you know, so many so many people to follow follow you? I mean, I'm I didn't do anything special. Like what a lot of the YouTubers do now is they follow trends. They do you know like 
prank videos. Um, they do like challenges and stuff. I've never done anything like that just because that's not me. You know, that's not my personality. I'm just like super chill, laid back, and I just like to be real and genuine about who I am to hopefully give people that confidence. Um, but when I caught a spark was when, um, you know, when I first started, uh, I was just making videos about football and like what I was going through in, in the NFL. And then um, my wife surprised me um, that she was pregnant and she filmed it oh, behind my cool. back. And then she surprised me, and we I edited I edited that, <clears throat> excuse me, and I put it on YouTube, and then that one kind of blew up, and that got me yeah. some traction. And then I think I was around probably I want to say around twenty thousand subscribers maybe, but then I was with the Vikings, and I got released from the Vikings. And when I got released from the Vikings, I showed everything that happened. I showed me going to the facility, picking up my stuff. Um, talking to you know the um, the coaches and stuff, and then I got home and I just put the camera up and I was talking about how I really felt, like how hard it was for me, and I was just being really honest about how I felt and not like sugarcoating anything, you know, because that's who I am. And then my wife wanted to talk about it from her perspective, and my wife got on and she starts crying and talking about how hard it is for her. And then when people saw, you know, how genuine I was and how raw it was, I think that's what really showed people, like, man, this guy really is. You know, comfortable with who he is and not being afraid to put up, you know, somewhat of a facade of like being tough or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like I was just like, like man, this <laughs> sucks. You know what I'm saying? Like this is this isn't fun. Like I've been through so much the past couple of years, and now for this to happen when it's in Minneapolis, when in Minneapolis where I live, and we thought this was home, and you know we thought this is where God was calling us, and then it just didn't happen. And I was real about all that, and people um, really appreciated that. And then after that, that's when like my subscribers really you know, peaked up and that video kind of just took off. And it was cool for me to see because I didn't act, you know, I literally just put the camera up and I'm like, man, I'm just going to talk to the camera and just say how Mm -hmm. I feel, you know, and it just felt Mm -hmm. good to know that the people who are following me are following me because of genuinely who I am and the me not being afraid of being vulnerable and honest on a platform where, you know, I feel like a lot of creators are scared to do so. Right. And I feel like with YouTube and then social media, and people's kind of accounts that there is a lot of sugarcoating, yeah. like you said. Only post the best things in the world that happen. You know, it's all, everything's amazing. And, then, mm-hmm. you know, people can really see through that. And so th- I'm sure that resonates. Oh, yeah, them. yeah. And, yeah, that's one of the that's one of the biggest compliments or comments that I get on my, on my, in the comments. And when people write me on Instagram or Snapchat or whatever, it's like they really appreciate that I'm honest and that I'm real and that they can feel that through the camera. And that was my biggest thing as I was going up. Like, man, I'm never going to put up some front of this is who I am. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm like, mm-hmm. what, you, what you see on that YouTube channel is what you're going to see when you meet me in person. Like, I don't want to have to, I don't want to have to put up this persona of somebody else. Cause that's exhausting. Right? Like <laughs> I have to go out and be different to show you like, that's who I am on video. No, I'm going to show you who I am because if I do that, I know if you're following me, you genuinely care about what's going on in my life, what I do, how I handle things and stuff. So that's where it really matters. Like right now, when I'm doing YouTube, I'm making sure YouTube is spitting my life rather than my life fitting YouTube. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and I think that's what um, that's what uh, that's what ultimately what I'm trying to accomplish and do. And so far, it's um, it's doing pretty well. I would say for only for being on YouTube a really short amount of time. Yeah. And so you got married early last year. Is that right? I got married. I get the so it's hard for me to figure out the years because I'm so used to going by football time. By football time. <laughs> so I actually got married not last year, but the year before that in twenty sixteen. Oh, yeah, my wife's gonna kill me. I, don't, I think it was August. I'm not hundred percent. I won't, I won't <laughs> tell her. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was August. So I got married in 20, at the end of twenty sixteen. But I always yeah. say last year because it was during my last year of football season when I was supposed to go into. So I always get confused. But it was at the end of twenty sixteen. Yeah, so I'd love to know some of the the things you guys are doing to, you know, just make marriage work and and really fit in. And and I cheated a little bit. I watched one of your videos. I -hmm. forget when it – I think it was the 2008 one you did recently. Sorry, 2018. Wow. And where you you and your wife were talking about uh, structure. Like, and you mentioned how structure is a is a good thing, and I love that note. Oh, yeah. I totally agree. Mm -hmm. And so what Mm -hmm. are some of the things you guys are doing along those lines? Um, to help organize life, I guess. I I think the biggest thing is to understand um, roles, like the role for her as a hu- for, for her as a husband, for me as a husband, and for her as a wife. Like, what are we supposed to be taking care of to make sure that this household is ran smoothly and things are functioning right? So we just put out a schedule of like this. These are my expectations for you, and this is my ex- expectations. Uh, that she expects out of me. 
and mm-hmm. um, that's been working great. Like I have to make sure, like for example, I got to take the dog out every morning and night. Like that's my responsibility. She has to make sure that when the clothes are, I wash the clothes, you fold them and you put them up. Um, make sure I always take out the trash. Make sure, okay, you cook two meals a week, I'll cook one, and then we'll agree what we're cooking. Um, every Saturday we have to clean up the house. You have an hour to clean up your part. I have an hour to clean up my part. And then we, I have to come up with one activity every week that we do together as uh, as a married couple. Like, it's just stuff like that that oh, really fine. gets the house. Yeah, it's stuff like that that really gets the house um, running smoothly, and, and the structure feels good because we feel like we're progressing. And every Saturday, we both – every Saturday, we have uh, both have an assignment to where we pick a project in the house that we have to do individually so the house is moving forward. So, for example, if there's, like – a bunch of like a pile of stuff in the corner of a room that's been there forever and this saturday it's my responsibility to get that out the way so we can progress and get the house moving forward to like eventually wanting to you know get the floors redone or something like that because it's hard to do to progress when there's a bunch of little stuff around the house and you feel so cluttered to where like it feels overwhelming so we're trying we try to block those off i mean knock those off one by one and it's been working great and the biggest thing that we do is every sunday we have a talk. Okay, how is how did the week go? What could I do better? What could you do better? Um, what am I looking for? I didn't like this. Okay, we we got in a little argument. What caused the argument? Okay, next time this comes up, we have to handle it this way. And that's what we've been doing. And it's been honestly, it's changing our marriage and it's changing the way we communicate with each other. And you know, the goal is to have our daughter um, see that and then try to find that in a relationship when she gets to that point in her life of finding someone to uh, be with. That's so amazing. I really like that. When I think of your, you called it a chore chart, right? I think is what you guys call your <laughs> yeah, that's what, goals. <laughs> yeah, my wife, my wife jokes around and calls it a chore chart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that's not a popular term with like other, you know, your yeah, football I know. friends. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> but, but either way, I think about that and I think about setting expectations and it makes it crystal clear to each other, you know, mm-hmm. what the expectations are, which is nice. And then your Sunday chat is kind of like an open forum so yeah, it gives you an opportunity to like, I guess, air any issues or grievances, which is perfect because, you know, if you don't have that, then you've got to awkwardly come up with a time that's like, hey, so I didn't like, and then yeah, you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah, can go either way. It's better to set the expectation. Okay, on Sunday we're gonna have this talk, so bring everything you got on Sunday. We're gonna talk about a thing because nobody really likes for at a random time of the day. Hey. Like, you know, that, that, that comment, hey, can we talk? Like, those are the yeah. words you don't, you don't like hearing in the middle of the week. So we decided, okay, at the end of the week, let's talk. So when Monday comes, we have, you know, new set goals, new expectations that we're going to go into the week and perform and do better on those. How do you fit in your production schedule into your week home life, basically? Because you're editing at home, right? I guess at a home office yeah. or something. And yeah. How do you kind of balance your work at home life with your regular, you know, family life? Um, it's something I'm still um, trying to get to grasp better now cause, because I get up in the morning around 7 and then I'll, I'll read until 8 because that's when my wife starts work. And I watch my daughter from 8 to 1. It was when her grandma comes picks her up. But when my daughter sleeps, um, that's when I'll try to work on the videos or try to film something. Mm-hmm. And then at, after, at 1 o'clock, I leave to go work out at 2. And then after that, I get back home around 4, around 4.30. And then my wife can watch her, and I do a lot of my editing then. So that's kind of my workflow now. Um, and it's just really taking the opportunity when, it, when they arise, when she sleeps, is, to, is honestly the best time. Because before she was born, you know, I had all day to edit and take breaks and stuff. So now when she sleeps, I really take advantage of those, that hour, 45 minutes or whatever it is. But now that I've been doing it for so long, I can be efficient and, um, you know, edit things up pretty fast uh, because I found my rhythm and my style. When I first started editing, it took me two, three days to make a video of me sitting down and talking. You know what I'm saying? Uh, now, I, yeah. now I can go to a bunch of different locations, add music, color it, make it look good because I've been doing it for a while. So just the repetition has really got me um, got me uh, good efficiency in creating uh, my videos. I got you. And you mentioned your daughter. How old is your daughter? She's six and a half months now. Oh, that's really exciting. So I think I have a six and a half month old day, or a girl. <laughs> oh, you think so? <laughs> I, I think it's it's close. Born in July. When was yours born? <laughs> August. August. Okay. Yep. So that's funny. <laughs> so about fatherhood, has anything? I guess what surprised you the most about fatherhood? 
Um, I would say nothing surprised me in a sense because yeah. I didn't go in with any expectations because I just know it was such a personal thing. You know, like I didn't. Anytime I did ask advice from close friends who were fathers, they were like, "Man, it's so different for everybody that you kind of just kind of ride the wave and like kind of figure out as you go." Um, the biggest mm-hmm. thing that I think that kind of surprised me is the lack of sleep that you get. I'm just like, yo, I do not <laughs> sleep anymore. Cause as an athlete, I'm so used to, you know, I got to get my eight to nine hours every night, you know, I have a bedtime and stuff, but uh-huh. my daughter is my sleep when I go to sleep and she's my alarm clock now. So my schedule is so sporadic now that I kind of just go with it. Some days I sleep well, some days I don't, but the majority of the time I don't sleep well. And it's, it's getting to the point where I'm getting pretty used to it. Um, so like my body has become an alarm clock based on, you know, what I hear <laughs> at nighttime, yeah. uh, my daughter moves or makes a noise or something like that. Yeah. I remember one time I told my boss at the time that, yeah, my daughter's now, or my son at the time was now sleeping through the night. He's like, oh, okay, so all right, do I have your full attention? Are you a hundred percent now? I'm like, yeah, I should be fully rested. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's how I go. <laughs> you know, what's funny is, so I have two boys and a girl and i actually every time i forget about how little sleep it is you know i'm like Mm -hmm. oh yeah let's have a kid that'll be a great idea and then you know it still is a great idea right but i just get so little sleep i'm like oh i forgot it how did i forget about this like oh yeah no i don't think i'll ever forget the sleep so i'm just like yeah i do not (laughs) sleep and like you feel like you feel it through the day right when you don't sleep and then doing a bunch of stuff you're working whether you're working out like all that stuff adds up but I think over time, you know, um, your body adapts to anything. So I think over time, you know, it'll adapt. But when you obviously have a kid, if it's not back to back, then your body's conditioned to sleep again, and then you're doing it all over again, like, like mm-hmm. not sleeping. Yeah, bouncing over to your to sports a little bit. You mentioned you started early. How early did you start with football? I started playing football when I was around nine years old. So I started when I was yeah. you know, like a little, a little, as a little kid. What do you think about your daughter playing sports or if you have a son, like, with, with football? When would you want to start them? Do you have any ideas on that or advice uh, for me? <laughs> uh, I think, to me, it's more like, – so one of my goals is, like, to come up with a program where there's, like, a facility for little kids who can come in and there's, all the sports are in there. So there's basketball, football, mm-hmm. golf, tennis, whatever. And then I kind of feel like – let the kids go around and play around and let them, whatever gravitates to them, whatever ball they like the most, mm-hmm. whatever action that they like the most, that's what they want to play. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of figuring out what age that really works, you know, because, like, some kids, I don't, I'm not really good with ages. Like, I don't understand, like, understand. <laughs> what what <laughs> they do at certain ages. So I'm kind of struggling with that. But I think that um, depending on the age, just kind of figuring out, you know, what they like and what kind of things they do as a kid or as a, like a little kid. Like they, do they like to run around a lot? Are they really, really active with climbing or something? You know what I mean? Like I, uh, I think it's a, it's a, it's kind of just, you know, scouting your your baby as they grow and kind of see what they're naturally good at and kind of going in that way while also being open to other things like that uh, facility or that I, that I'm thinking about kind of doing. Because I was I played football because. My parents, like football and basketball was a sport back home, to be honest with you. That was the way you got out. And football is what my cousins did, so that's why my family put me in football. Because to be honest with you, if I remember the first time we did tackling, it was I'm like, Daddy, I don't know if this is for me. Like, I don't know if I'm supposed to be out here hitting these people like this because it don't feel yeah. good to me. Over, over time, I got used to it, and I loved competition. I loved, you know, you know, having goals with teammates and stuff, and that's what I love more than anything. Yeah, I like your note about basically a facility or the idea of a kid being able to pick the sport because a lot of times I feel like the parent kind of almost picks for them and then they're stuck in that kind of groove for a while. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the majority of the time. Like, how many stories have we seen of, you know, I play because my dad or my mom wants me to. I really don't want to, but I don't want to disappoint them, blah, blah, blah. You know, that's like the same story over and over. And I would never want my kids to play something or do something because they think I want them to. I want yeah. them to do. I want them to do whatever they want. You know, like whether that's art. You know, with singing or painting or drawing or playing a piano or whatever. I don't care what they do, as long as they love it <laughs> and they're striving for it and they're working hard. That's all that matters to me. Because when I look at my childhood, I wish I could have done more things. Like I wish I could have done, you know, play the guitar or learn an instrument or play a different sport or went to some kind of artist school to learn how to draw or something you know I, i've always done one thing and i was playing football and I'm, my mom 
mind is conditioned in a football way. Like I said, explained earlier about, you know, how the years work. Like that's how my mind mm-hmm. is conditioned because of football alone. And that's yeah. kind of how I, um, how I function. Even like I'm a, I'm a, um, a big chess player. And when I play chess, I play chess the way how I play on defense. You know what I mean? Like I, I like to attack, but I know how to get out and make a move. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. it's just, it's just how my mind is conditioned. What about NFL this year? Like, what point do you think your agent will start calling and saying, "Hey, X, Y, and Z team are interested"? Like, when does that happen? Is that now? Is that in two months or what? No, it's all year. So he lets me okay. know when, um, you know, when teams are calling, what teams are saying, what are they thinking. It's all year, so I get calls hmm. from him um, all the time about, you know, who's talking and where are they saying, and you know, the combines coming up. It's the combines from March second through the 5th, I believe. So that's when he's out there in Indianapolis, you know, talking to all the teams and coaches because that's where everybody's at. And, um, you know, that's kind of how that whole thing works. What about, didn't you have a hamstring injury? I saw you on a news on a news thing out there in Minnesota on your channel, and you mentioned a hamstring in- injury. Is that fully recovered and everything's good? Yeah, yeah I'm fully recovered. So I, the last team I was with was with the Bengals, and I had a grade 2 um, hamstring pull that had me out mm-hmm. the entire year. Um, and that was the last team that I'm with, but now I'm fully, um, covered and, um, you know, working out full throttle and just, you know, staying ready for the next opportunity, um, that comes my way. So what's kind of some good advice for someone like me? I'm not a professional athlete, but I like to be active and go play, you know, basketball, but I work out every day, but my hamstrings, I feel like are, I have a history of them the most. So what's the best, what's your, kind of your preventative maintenance for hamstrings? I mean, I just do what my trainer should tell me to do, to be honest with you. Like, <laughs> like for me, like, I do a lot of, uh, like, dry needling, uh, massage, uh, strengthening exercises that I don't honestly know the names of. I've never right. been hurt. I, this is the first time in my whole career that I've ever been hurt. You know, like, I've never had, like, an injury where I was out for a long time. So I've ne- I'm so new to, like, you know, the process of healing and being patient and stuff. Like, mm-hmm. it's so it's so new to me. Like, I was trying to... You know, my competitive mind, I was trying so hard to get back that I was really pushing my hamstring. And I went out to work one day, uh, you know, when I first heard it, like a month or two later, and I popped it again because I was really, really pushing it. And then I was like, man, I need to slow down and just understand that this is a process. There's nothing I can do but, you know, train right, eat right, get as much sleep as I can, and to just let it heal. That's all I could do. And I've learned a lot through this process of, you know, being injured and um, going through recovery. You mentioned dry needling. Is that like acupuncture? Yeah, it's like acupuncture. I think it's I don't know the the, you know, the science the, the, uh-huh. the scientific. Does term. it work? Yeah, it works. I love dry needling. I did dry needling before I got hurt. I did it like on other parts of my body to release, you know, tension and tightness and stuff. But I think dry needling is like probably number one on my list for recovery and um, you know health when it comes to you know tight muscles and stuff like that. Like dry needling is is fantastic. I do dry needling, and then there's something else called ART, which is active release therapy, and it's kind of like it's it's like stretching, uh, massage, and like intense like um, uh, movement all in one. Like it's hmm. by far like my favorite thing to do with my body. So in ART, is that like are you working with a trainer where they're stretching you? And yeah, you know, ART. You need a, yeah, ART. You need a professional who's licensed to do. You can do ART by yourself. So maybe if someone wanted to try it, you'd find a. I don't know. What would it have to be like a, a training facility kind of thing, or yeah. would it be like a, a massage place? Yeah, so a massage place. Like every, I mean, every trainer just has to get his license for it, and then wherever they work, then they have the ART license. It's just a practice that each trainer or masseuse or whatever have to learn to be able to do it. So there's not, like, one specific, like, ART facility. You know, like, anybody can right. be licensed for it. Well, that's awesome, man. Well, I'm really uh, I'm pulling for you this year, and hopefully I'll be uh, – I'm subscribed, so hopefully I'll see uh, some updates <laughs> from you in a couple of weeks or whatever when the combine happens, and uh, you'll have some more activity, and uh, we'll see you on the field here soon. Yeah, thank you, thank you. That's what that's what the that's what the hope is. Well, I already said. Well, thanks so much for being on today, man. Oh, thank you for having me. It was great talking to you. All right, guys, that is a wrap with Sed. You can find him on his YouTube channel by searching "As Said by Me." Sed spelled C E D. You can also find him on Instagram at the same name, "As Said by Me." Thanks so much for listening. Feel free to reach out to me anytime. I'd like to thank our sponsor today, HealthIQ.com. Health IQ is basically life insurance for people who exercise. They are able to give lower rates to people who exercise because they have lower risk for heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. 
Check them out if you have a chance to see if you can lower your bills. That's healthiq.com, and be sure to mention promo code FFF. All right, we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Fatherhood Fitness Finance Podcast. You can find us at fatherhoodfitnessfinance.com.